Hello, this is Haka the Bean, and I am here once again with SCP-6666, or the Big Tree. Although it seems to be about a lot more than the tree. Today we are on part 3 with Addendum 6, and uh, I don't know where I'm going to be ending, probably 9 or 10, we will see. It might even be as early as 8. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. If you do not, however, enjoy the video, then I guess that's your loss, and you can end leave now. Or after the video. Be sure to comment about how much you would dislike it. I need that engagement anyway. Let's get into this. Addendum 66666 Remote Reconnaissance Log The following is a video transcript of an unmanned exploration attempt into the cavern floor below the is big tree. The drone in question, a foundation a foundation issue of 4.5 kilogram MK7 octocopter codenamed Hero had an 80 and an 8 hour battery life and was capable of operating at distances of up to 23 kilometers. Hero was capable of operating autonomously outside of its control range using a modified artificial intelligent conscript model or AIC, codenamed Valor. The Valor module is not itself considered sentient but is capable of base level program problem solving and crisis resolution, as well as more complex mission objectives. The Hero Drone was also equipped with a small remote quadcop, after a codename Champion, for insertion into areas Hero could not access due to its considerable size. Project Paragon, South American Forward Operating Site, or SAFOS, Exploratory Vehicle Reconnaissance Log. MK-87 Drone Hero rests on the Delta Tower of Repertory platform prior to liftoff, engineers perform a free flight inspection of Hero prior to the start of the mission. After a short period of time, Hero is given a green light and lifts off from the platform. Turning north, a Hero approaches SCP-6666. As Hero's sensors fully come online, this tree is visible in center frame. As Hero closes it is on the tree, a hole mounted at flood lamp activates. Hero continues approaching until Oh, this tree encompasses the entire frame, and it begins to ascend slightly. This is the sound of... Uh, what was it? Hector? Thrashing and roaring is audible over the den of a hero's rotors. After 20 minutes, Hector comes into frame. The entity is trapped halfway sunken into the flesh of this tree. All that is done during every... As it is done during every a previous exploratory mission... Hector ignores the drone completely, seemingly single-mindedly fixed on attempting to free itself from this tree. Thick clouds of green smoke pour out from, from the tree, which burn and blister or Hector's skin. The entity appears to be in immense pain and continues to attack the tree with long metallic spear affixed to oh, its uppermost right arm. I think it's Hector. Correct me if I'm wrong. After 30 minutes of observation, Hero begins to descend away from SCP-6666 A and the tree. I'm not uh, reading that over. Why did I do that? Anyway, Hiram tells to observe the ground below, which is far out of the range of observation tower, the spotlights, and in total darkness. Night vision cameras mounted on Hero will return inconclusive footage. Hero activates several other hole mounted spotlights as it continues to descend. Reaching its intended at elevation, Hero turns east towards the closest wall of the cavern and proceeds forward. After 21 minutes of flight, Hero moves out of the range of its controller, and the Valor or module takes over control of the vehicle. Shortly thereafter, the north wall of the cavern comes into view. The surface consists mostly of rock and soil with the large snaking roots of uh, this tree covering considerable sections of the wall. Much of the wall is obscured by... The green haze emanated from the tree. 
But as Hero approaches the smoke, Oak is blown away and the structure becomes visible in the darkness. Immediately in front of Hero is a large stone structure in a significant state of ruin. Rubble and debris cover the ground across the main structure and two large cylindrical stone ruins. The leaves of once been towers lie a short distance away. The layout of the debris and the condition of the structure indicate that at some point in the past, the entire building fell a considerable distance and then came to rest, though not as such a speed as would obliterate the sun walls themselves. Hero turns towards the center of the cavern as smoke begins to dissipate in the immediate and additional immediate area. Additional structures appear. I knew something was off. The ruins in the area around Hero are an unusual mix of buildings, monuments, equipment, and other items with no discernible of single point of origin. Present are the ruins of a large stone religious structure bearing an unusual symbolism. On the exterior, large row well houses with thatched roofs and strange fleshy membranes stretched edge tightly over large arch supports that appear to be bones. I'm guessing some of it, it is from the psychic cult then. The ground is layered with scare tools, cookware carts, weapons, and papers. A light breeze picks up many of the items on the ground begin to and many of the items on the ground begin sliding down the rocky embankment towards the bottom of the cavern. <sighs> Hero gains a small amount of altitude and falls the rocky slope further down. Below, broken and collapsed houses become visible as do a crude storehouse and a collapsed great end mill. Despite the apparent age of much of the architecture, the ruins are in unusually good condition. Hero lowers itself on enough to capture an image of a rolled piece of leather with words written on it in black ink on the exterior. The text has clearly not faded. The drone turns east and begins tracking further down the slope towards a more clear section of land. Hero's infrared camera comes online and turns back towards the walls of the cavern where it is now clear that the entire or wall and the slope of the cavern is covered with tens of thousands of buildings as far as the eye can see. Many of these structures, including a nearby stone statue of a headless stag, are intertwined with the roots of SCP of, the tr of this tree, and are being slowly pulled seemingly into the earth itself. As Hero passes over numerous other buildings, it passes one crumbled house and life form I did. A fire alarm it it activates. Valor takes Hero closer to the house and lands, launching the champion and light. I Break on quad copper to further investigate the space. Champion leaves Hero and enters the collapsed house, carefully avoiding the fall and debris. As Champion reaches the back of the building, which Hero could see through a partially collapsed roof, he observes he's a veely emaciated body of a small humanoid figure. The figure is curled into the fetal position, its face in its hands, and its entire body turned into the corner. Champion runs thermal and electrum. Mechanical scans on the figure, which is clad simply in a thin cloth dress, and determines if E and D is fully deceased. I don't like trying to say that word. I, I have a feeling that I might mispronounce it one day. Showing no signs of life, Jamie briefly assesses the remainder of the ruined building and then leaves through the open roof. Instead of returning to Hero, Champion enters several other nearby structures to assess their interiors in a in a building that appears to have at least at one point held draft animals. Champion discovers the likewise emaciated corpse of several horses, many of whom are covered in large puncture wounds. And the faces of the animals, distorted as they are by the condition of their bodies, are very clearly twisted in a look of fear or panic. At the back of the structure is the body of a single canine, its nails and paws worn down to nearly the nearest to the bone, and despite marks in the wooden clang of the rear. And that's what marks anyone in the ending of the rear door to structure. Champion leaves the structure and rejoins with Hero. Hero launches again and turns west, away from the rock wall of the cavern, and in the direction of this of the large tree. The lights of the observation tower is almost, almost entirely blocked by a cloud above and around on Hero. The drone follows the slope of the cavern and down, passing a numerous individual over in structures until it reaches a sharp line in the architectural record, edge where the ruins abruptly end. 
The rocket's slope comes down, but no other structures are visible through the smog. Hero continues his approach until another life form identifier alarm activates. Hero's primary camera narrows in on another large Hydra human and Lloyd entities brought on the rocky ground below. This figure is likely is likewise emaciated and appears to have been crawling up the slope when it perished. As Hero sails over the uh, and the end where the smog is blown away by its rotors, additional alarms sound as our detects additional life forms. Hero's primary camera pans around and sees dozens of similar or human or entities face down on the slope and unmoving, but all appearing to have been attempting to crawl up it. As Hero moves over the additional corpses far down the slope, the full extent of the number of bodies is revealed. While on board, the counting incomplete by Valor is hampered by the extremely low lighting and thick fog Hero observes many hundreds of thousands of of emaciated humanoid corpses, all appearing to have been crawling away from something at the bottom of the slope. The corpses range in size from apparent children to full adults, with a mix of masculine and feminine features, as well as some animals and other indistinct life forms with both humanoid and animal characteristics. As the hero continues counting corpses over the long barren slope, Chairman dismounts from its parent drone and approaches the fig figures. It, as, it close, as it grows close, the condition of the bodies becomes clear. Each is covered in, in a fine layer of pale green residue from the cloud, and each displays signs that, that they were crawling or running away from something behind them. With self defense injuries inflicted on those around them, what was seemingly a desperate attempt to flee. The faces of all those visible show signs of shock and panic, though many lay on the ground in the fetal position, covering their faces with their hands. Champion returns to Hero, who has counted approximately 283,824 bodies in an area roughly a 0.87 kilometers squared. As Hero continues down the slope, the density of the corpses increases until the drone reaches the cabin floor, at which point the number and density of bodies begins to thin out. Hero continues forward towards the center of the cavern, by a stop by a proximity alarm. All external floodlights Turn to face forward where a line of towering dark trees, 100 meters tall, extend away from here on both directions, roughly 40 meters in front of the drone. The under layer of trees, though shorter and thinner than the larger bodies, create a dense and seemingly impenetrable layer of plant life that Hero cannot enter. Champion once again launches from the back of Hero, rising slightly and carefully entering the forest, while Champion is itself is Cover with powerful spotlights, the incredibly dense trees negate much of their usefulness. As Shabby continues into the forest, Hero lands outside the tree line to convert to conserve a, a battery, which is falling to 62%. As any dip below 55% would warrant an immediate return to base. Valor adjusts the mission plan to return to Delta Tower immediately after Champion finishes its reconnaissance. After three minutes navigating the dense forest, Champion reports an instrument error. Although the drone has not performed any unusual course corrections, it is it now believes it is flying inverted and moving laterally to the south at a rapid rate of speed. The drone attempts to correct its pitch, but strikes a tree and falls. A ha loud high pitch of yelling sound is here, and then Champion comes to rest. Although its instrument has continued to function, its primary camera is destroyed in the impact. Jeremy gets to chime his recovery tone, which is heard by Hero's onboard microphone. Over the course of the following five minutes, Hero oh, continues to collect data as Jeremy's recovery tone continues to chime. Five minutes and 16 seconds after impacting ground, Jeremy's recovery tone and begins to grow increasingly faint as it's moving away from Hero. However, the drone's onboard sensors report no movement whatsoever. This continues for an additional 8 minutes and 47 seconds, after which Champion's recovery I can no longer be detected by Hero. Hero waits to be determined at 35 min 30 minutes for Champion's recovery. After the period elapses with Champion now only reporting telemetry data, Hero begins to ascend again towards Delta Tower. As it rises over 6 kilometers, it passes out of 
Champions data relay, a range, and the quadcopter is no longer detected. One hour and nine minutes later, as two groups stop to gather additional telemetry data, Hero lands on the platform at Delta Tower. Oh, Champion died. Now oh, I'm sad. Anyway. <sighs> Let's see how long we've been recording. 15 minutes already. I just want to end up. Addendum 66-66-7 Paragon Leadership at Meeting Transcript 2 The following is an, is an excerpt from a recorded meeting of Project Paragon on Leadership held on, on May 2, 2019. Internal Audio Recording Transcript in Attendance Paragon Director Shannon Lancaster Foundation Technology A, a Director Kane Pathos Crow Department of Antediluvian and Research Director Corin Malthus, SCP-6666 Lead Researcher Dr. Osmond Isles, Head 1 Commander Cecilia Estrell. Also in attendance, and remotely, is Toby Miles, who is a Paragon ad admin, Rodney Egoteris, Corey Peters, Joseph Well, and Lindsay Frazier, who are all Aragon admins, Eric Oludo, Janice Mendez, who are both of the Paragon Financial, Errol McCarthy of Paragon on Logistics, Zhao Quin Xiao, Dr. Brent Grant, who are both of Paragon Scientific, Dominga Rainey, Len Rosser, who are both Paragon Research, Dr. Megan and Wiles, Dr. Von Blanc, Von Blank, Eileen Tor, Western Regional, Co Regional Command and Administration, Assistant Director uh, Zhu Jialong of Technology, Dr. Cameron Saint and Pierre of the Ethics Committee, who's the Ethics Committee liaison, and then there's Dr. Lorman. Loman Hall, Dr. Jane Zen, Dr. Patricia Dane, Dr. Sam um, Alal, Dr. John German, Dr. Oh, wait, these are all the ethics committee, and then Dr. Director Carlisle Actis of the classification committee, Quentin Page of the Overseer Council liaison, 051, 053, and 0512. It's going to be hard to do the voices for all of these people without making them all sound very similar. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming all the way out here. Dr. Crow, thank you for making the trip. Of course, I appreciate the invitation. All right, then, Dr. Malthus, I yield the floor. Thank you, Director Lancaster, and thank you, ladies, gentlemen, and esteemed persons of Project Paragon and the Greater Foundation staff for joining us. If you do not know my name, my name is Dr. Corin Malthus. I'm the director or of the Foundation's newest, oldest department. <laughs> the Department of Antediluvian Research. We are historians, collectors of information that has long since been and varied by the sense of time, and we've made it our goal to catalog and identify as much of this history as we can before it's too far gone. Dr. Malthus gestures to the projector screen where a list of dates is shown. Oh no, that's Director Malthus, my bad. Despite what you may I have been taught, it is now understand that while modern human history has been ongoing for just the last 3,000 years, the true story of our history extends for many hundreds it's of thousands of years before that, if not further. What occurred 300,000 years ago was a great immigration of our ancestors from Africa and the first Oak Crescent, where they had settled after the recession of the flood uh, at the waters. 
Floodwaters, you're probably asking yourself right now. Did he say floodwaters? As many of you who have already picked up by now, the, the alluvian part of antediluvian doesn't they refer to the Great Flood. A worldwide anomalous natural disaster has, is believed to have occurred sometime between four or 500,000 years ago, which does say in any extent societies that existed at the time and created massive upheaval in the natural order of dominance on this planet. Most evidence of the places is events and persons we study in the DOAR it was lost during this event, which itself is believed to have lasted for a hundred years or more. Those who did not race to high ground or build themselves a suitable vessel were, as expected, washed away when the waters fell, as was any history of them ever existing. However, our research goes back even further than that, back to the very beginning of the world itself. SCP-4840, the flying city of Autodopolis, is a broken fragment of the first city ever built on this planet, millions and millions of years ago. A proto-human known as a Sam was said to be its first king, and mankind as a whole was, was born there. Those early humans, which we, we would call Eternals now, though whether or not they are really eternal is the subject of some debate, are structurally similar to you and I now. Albeit the effort in many critical ways, or so than adjust their lifespans. SCP-73 and SCP-76, for example, are two of these early humans who have persisted in their own way for many, many millions of years. But wait, you might be thinking. What happened before that? The short answer is, uh, we don't know. Human beings are the only creatures that on this planet that have a written record of their history that we can translate over long periods of time. So anything else that existed at the time is lost to us, in one way or another. But there were other beings in existence back then. And this is when I need to tell you to take my hand and step blindly off the cliff because we need to have a discussion about gods. Yes, gods exist. If we're going to try, they should have not convinced you of this. Trust my words now. They exist, and they are powerful. And their actions are felt in our daily lives even now. Ah, yes. Miss, Miss Tor, you have a question? Thank you, Doctor. When you say gods, what kind of entity are you referring to specifically? Great question. There are a number of great a, of, of entities of great power that would be considered godlike by most people. But entities we are referring to are of a more fundamental variety. Well, it's too just like. So, of the gods who reside in Autodopolis back in those ancient days, we know of a couple. There's no. All part to. Thanks to no smart. Oh, part to SCP 4840A, himself one of the Eternals. We know of Mekane, the god who was broken and whose remnants are now subject of belief by the Moral's Church. We know of Yadabayat, revered above all by the Davites, and now whose power is siphoned by the Arcid Coast. Both these gods are connected in ancient texts of mankind. However, there are other beings alive at the same time as us, who predate humanity by untold millions of years. Those were the Fae, the Fair Folk, the Fairies, the... Mm. They're like, uh... As in so much that they are sentient, humanoid entities, generally, but beyond that, they could uh, not be more different than we are. But they also worship gods, most of which you've probably never heard of. A god of of night, a god of day, a god of sunrise, ice and sunsets, and Gaia, the gods of the earth are se itself. I mean, everyone knows of Gaia. Above all, all else, all else, they worship the go goddess of starlight and witches, Aya or Titania. Now, Aya in ancient legend was the goddess who walked over the canopies of the fairies' great forest and granted their wishes, and who would sing to them in the twilight of the world. She was also the fairest of the fairy gods and the one they loved the most. Most pictures of Aya, who was uh, later called Titania by the first men to encounter the fairies, are of being much like a fairy herself, but at some others depict her as a star or as a beam of moonlight, and even others depict her as a sort of mother, a, a tree in the heart of the fairies' dark forest. That leads us to where we are, are now. We believe the dead tree hanging upside down in the cavern Oas is, or at least was, the fairy goddess Titania, several taken from the artifact at the heart of SCP-29932, or also 
inconclusive, share undeniable of similarities to SCP-6666, and SCP-2932 OA seems confident that the artifact originates from the same guys that was worshipped by the fairies. Without bringing one of the ASU entities here to confirm it with their own eyes, there's no way to be absolutely certain. And truthfully, our research has shown that they are cagey at best in discussing the god in discussing the guys at all. But we still feel so much assuredness that we know what we're dealing with here. Yes, Mr. Gutierrez. Are we assuming that the street guys are self now dead as well? That's what we believe, yes. Do we know what caused this? Only speculation at this point, I'm afraid. The removal of, of the SCP-2932 artifact from within SCP-6666 could have certainly done it, though we have reason to believe that the artifact was removed after SCP-6666 was already dead. But the Indy is still mobile, correct? Your fire teams have had to turn burn back new growth? Correct. We have some speculation for why that is as well, but suffice it to say that the tree is the corpse of a god. A traditional understanding of what is and what and is not of what it is and is not capable of doing should be taken with a grain of salt. And the end and the entity inside of SB six 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 six, the humanoid creature, what do we know about its or origin? Yes, good. We were going to go there next, Dr. Isles, if you would. Thank you, Director. The entity the entity is believed to be one of the four ancient powerful entities where we've taken to calling the primeval demons. Prior to the Great Flood, there were numerous human civilizations over the span of tens of thousands of years, but the longest lasting of these was called the Sky Kings of Apollyon. Using information and gathered during the investigation of SCP-4812 of entities, we came to learn that the four entities were warriors who lived in the in that kingdom at the time, and were each affected by an unknown thaumatological event near the collapse of that civilization that altered their nature and turned them into the creature we see either today. The four of them, Lahire, Lancelot, Hector, and Ogier, were such important figures in the history of those early people, their names survived over thousands of years and were eventually worked into more modern folklore. Since the discovery of SCP 4840B, which is Lancelot, we've been assisting Director Lancaster and Project Paragon with the study and containment of these entities. The foundation has had at SCP 2254, the demon Lahire contained for some time without knowing what it was. As usual information gathered from SCP-4840 illuminated us to a lot of things, including the origin of 2254 and 4840B, the demon Lancelot. Each one, according to the old text, was afflicted by a different curse placed on them by a fairy, a princess. Lust for Lahire, which is why I'm not reading it. Wrath for Lancelot, despair for Ogier, and for our friend Hector, agony. Ah. Oh. The reason we founded Project Paragon was to mitigate the effects of these emerging entities. The global occult collation opened an ancient tomb in 2002 that we believe contained an entity somewhat related to the curses placed on the four demons, which themselves are related to the three 4812 entities. All of them are connected to the same event, described in the text as the, the desecration of a fake princess. If not other mistaken, Director Ermaltis can and back me up here. We believe that the Arrows in the collation found in the tomb is the same fate princess that created 4812 SCP that created SCP 4812, SCP 2254, SCP 4840B, SCP 66A, SCP 6666A, and the last undiscovered demon, Ogier. I still need to find a document about, about Ogier. Because at least is Ogier isn't about being lewd. It is something that I don't like on my channel. That is correct. So what is our next move? The O5s so I'm just gonna cover my mouth for because they are supposed to be mysterious anyway. 
Glad you asked, Overseer, but neat SCP-666 is a large forest that we believe contains ruins of Antediluvian origin that were pulled into the e cavern by SCP-6666. There's a potential treasure trove of information out there, reserved by seemingly an anomalous means that could be unimaginably useful to our efforts going forward. Project Paragon is working to mitigate the possible effects of, of the uh, 4812 entities as well as whatever damage could be caused by these four demons. It's been 17 years since the GOC dug up our arrows, and 4812K had been getting more and more aggressive during that time. We have reason to believe things are building to a head, and the more data we have available, the more prepared we'll be to handle these threats. So what I'd like to propose is... What I'd like to do is propose a manned expedition into the forest. Our drones aren't capable of going through right there, but an armed detail from HET-1 as well as some of our, oh, our own researchers and support staff should be making should be able to make progress enough to confirm whether or not we'll find what we're, what we're looking for in there. What are the limiting factors? The distance between the launch pad of Delta Tower and the floor of the void is over, over 35 kilometers. Currently, our plan is to lower the team down by cable car, our fastest models traveling at a safe speed, to move all the necessary personnel and equipment and get the team to the landing site in just over six hours. The other issue is, is one of pressure. The air at the bottom of the cavern is very rich. We believe it's breathable, but the return trip will have to be a long one to avoid the compression sickness. Just over 24 hours. The larger issue is the smog. SCP-6666 creates this particulate a substance from out of that opening in its side, and the substance is an extremely potent neurotoxin. Short-term exposure is a full shutdown of most neurological processes, and long-term exposure is CNS suppression and then death. <sighs> oh, right. Sorry, I got I space out. Our insertion suits can filter the substance out of the air, but the concern is that even a slight exposure to the residue on the suit's exteriors during transport could be deadly, so we've devised a plan to mitigate the effects of this substance, at least in the short term. So, director, oh, just to a new slide, we have a twofold well, plan in place to limit the danger. Two members of HET-1 will carry with them life flamethrowers who help with clearing a pathway and with limiting the amount of pollen in the air. We also, uh, we plan on putting a temporary foam seal here over the open gash in SCP-6666. Basically, put duct tape on it. <laughs> How do you plan on accomplishing this? With help from our Foundation and Class Exhibition, we've developed a high-density a, a poly I lay in the foam that can be sprayed at a range of from any of, of our M MK V2 vehicles. It fully sets within a few minutes, and once we've got the opening sealed up, we just wait 24 hours for the remaining dust in the air to settle and our teams can proceed as intended. This is actually what my team has been working on in the past few months under Operation Catarize. It shouldn't do any actual lasting harm to the anomaly itself and will break down after a period of about 5 weeks, but still is rigid while in place. Do you expect SCP-6666-A 6 6 6 to give you any troubles? Not especially. We can attempt a sedative if the entity attempts to interfere, and if that is insufficient, we can bind the entity using cable launchers mounted on Charlie Tower. Realistically, we just need to keep S we just need to keep 6666-A occupied until the foam sets up. It's as hard as rock once it sets, and we should mechanically and should mechanically seal itself into the rough opening. Very good. Director Lancaster, 
Please keep my office in the loop. I want to know the moment we have boots on the ground. Yes, sir, of course. We'll take questions here in a moment, but if nobody has anything in there now, dismiss this us all. I know Director or Crow and Commander or Astral have more preparations to get to. Very good, thank you all for your time, and we'll reconvene in post operation. Alright, I think we can do this. <sighs> Following. At them, 6666.8. Zaf Psychology Report. Oh, I said point eight. weird. Anyway. Note, the following is a log compiled by Zaf Psychologist Dr. Rich. It's Arnold of... Paragon Step of... Ecological Complaints between January 2018 and May 2019. <sighs> he went to do the dates that way. Anyway. Name Simon Cantrell. Date February 13, 2018. Symptoms anxiety and depression. Note symptoms believed to have been brought on by workplace conditions, so she gets afraid of heights. Recommended recommend moving to an alternate site. Ricardo but arrows. On uh, March 24, 2018. Depression. Someone is generally unhappy about their extended assignment. Natalia Abazera. March 26, 2018. Paranoia. Someone reports feeling like she is being watched when working within the SCP-6666 cavern. Leonardo on Neves. June 4th, 2018. Depression. So he reports generally feeling general feeling of malaise. Sam Allison. July 13, 2018. Anxiety. So he reports feeling generalized anxiety after awakening. Victor Cross, September 9th, 2018. Bad dreams, anxiety. So he reports generalized as anxiety and bad dreams. Vivian Endo Ogado, September 23rd, 2018. Suicide. Self oofing thoughts. Self expressions, general. or feelings of despair referred or to specialists. Caesar Lauren Enso. I don't know if I said that right. October 2nd, 2018. Depression and bad dreams. So reports general depression unsettling dreams. Antonio Antonio Overus November 14, 2018. Anxiety and bad dreams. So reports bad dreams. Benny Beniclo Ochaves. November 18, 2018. Anxiety and bad dreams. She reports vivid dreams of a monster killing his his mother. Wow, that's dark. Janice D. Campos, November twenty eighth, twenty eighteen. Anxiety. She reports general feeling of unease after awakening. Cleaver or Antins, December twenty eighth, twenty eighteen. Anxiety and bad dreams. She reports a vivid dream wherein a monster with six eyes kills his daughter. Well, that's not good. Antonio Cordero. January 3rd, 2019. Anxiety, bad dreams. She reports a vivid dream wherein a monster with six eyes kills his wife. Anita Wells. January 4th. Anxiety and bad dreams. So it report, so it reports of a dream where in a monster with six eyes that kills her brother. Hmm. Paloma um, Amaryllis. January 15th, 2019. Anxiety and bad dreams. So it reports of a dream where in a monster with six eyes kills her daughter. 
Geraldo Tamamara. January 23rd, 2019. Fear and bad dreams. Some reports of a dream where a monster killed with six eyes kills him. Lee Winslow. February 3rd, 2019. Anxiety and bad dreams. A lot of these are just bad dreams. Subject reports of a dream where a monster with six eyes kills his son. Bernardo Esseves. February 12th, 2019. Anxiety and bad dreams. So reports of a dream wherein they are trying to scream but cannot. Danielle Oday as an an and co. I'm not sure if I said that right. These names are getting hard to pronounce. March fifteenth, twenty nineteen. Anxiety and bad dreams. So reports of a dream wherein a monster with six eyes kills every human at Sappos. Kyle Williamson, March 23rd, 2019, Anxiety and Bad Dreams. So, after reports of vivid dream wherein and a monster with six eyes devours them. Lucas Oliveira, April 28th, 2019, Panic, Anxiety, and Bad Dreams. Subject reports being extreme imanis at all times while on assignment and reports experiencing multiple vivid dreams wherein a monster with six eyes consumes his family. Augusto Braga, May 3rd, 2019, Panic, and Bad Dreams. So reports feeling extreme panic, show signs of self-inflicted injuries, and reports of dreams wherein a monster with six eyes is eating their heart. Diego da Acosta, May 11th, 2019. Panic, bad dreams, self of termination and thoughts. So I'm not going to say the actual word of because YouTube hates that word. Sarga reports generalized overwhelming panic has made it recent attempts on their own life and reports vivid dreams wherein they are trapped in a hole while a monster with six eyes devours their mother. <sighs> that was 42 minutes of SCP-6666 or the big tree. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. If you did not enjoy this video, then you just wasted 43 minutes of your time listening to me try and read. I hope you enjoyed this. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.